I am uh, Nancy Zastadil, and I work as the gallery director at Tamarind Institute in Albuquerque, and we're associated with the University of New Mexico as part of the College of Fine Arts. And I've been working there for a few years, and um, I ended up taking that job um, probably mostly because of my experience um, in working with artists and being a curator for, um, I guess, over a decade now. And um, I am also a freelance editor and arts writer, and I own a business called The Necessarian, um, through which I offer editing services to artists. And I'm also an avid but non-competitive runner, which um, that really is what brought me here to WISC. Female curators, I do think, and at least what I've seen, is that they are more willing to listen to the artist's experience, um, the artist's intention within their work, and to be responsive in that um, conversation and in that collaboration. I started The Necessarian, oh, I would say maybe um, probably about almost 10 years ago now. And it came as a result of having worked with artists in this curatorial role. Um, and having also studied art myself in undergrad, I just found that artists on the whole um, have a hard time communicating with a written approach. Um, you know, so many artists work visually um, that to start to put specific words to what they're doing and why uh, can be really difficult. So when I realized, um, and credit to my mom, who was an English teacher, um, when I really realized and became more comfortable with the fact that editing came pretty easy to me. Um, I started working with artists more on their writing, whether it's their artist statements, um, you know, project descriptions, grant proposals, um, website language, things like that, even their, you know, thesis dissertations and things. Um, so then once I realized that there was really a need for that, um, I started charging for it um, and then just set up a business as the necessarian so that I can um, offer that you know, formally and on a consistent basis to artists. So here at WISC, I'm researching the socio-political impacts of women's movement, specifically running, and how it has been used to advance women's rights. And I'm using as a central case study the 1977 National Women's Conference relay race, which took place, uh, well, it went from Seneca Falls, New York, to Houston, Texas. And so alongside of that, I'm also looking at contemporary um, efforts by whether it's female individuals or female-led organizations and how they are using their platform, um, again, running to advance human rights. There is a connection to art um, within the, the running sort of research, which is vague, but it is there for me. Um, and it basically comes down to movement and bodies in space. So having studied visual art, um, you know, that also lends itself to, at least for me, an interest, um, sort of a deep curiosity in performance art and movement, um, including theater and dance. And so to make a long story short um, and to try to draw some, some direct threads, um, really it comes down to women's movement and how we use our bodies in different spaces and, and take ourselves through different places um, in an effort to uh, make a statement, draw attention to either ourselves or other people in the space or other people who are not in the space. Um, and so, all of that has um, just really culminated in this interest in the relay race. Um, and as a runner myself and as someone who works in the arts, the, just the idea of movement is kind of always with me and what my body in a specific space um, can mean or can imply. And the impact that it has on, like I said, the other people in that space or um, the absence of certain folks in that space. My interest in the relay race came honestly um, because I'm kind of a TV junkie. So I was watching um, a Netflix miniseries called Mrs. America um, that was about the Equal Rights Act um, being the attempt to ratify the ERA. And um, there's a passing reference in that series to the relay race. Um, I had not 
grown up with really strong feminist um, teachings or you know a basis that way and had very little knowledge about even the ERA and so as I was watching this series the mention of that race just piqued my interest and so um, as I started to learn a little bit more about it, just in very, you know, simple Googling efforts, um, you know, I found a little bit of information about it, but not a lot. And then one day I um, found an article that had been printed in a journal by a woman named Dr. Alyssa Samick, and she is at the University of California, Fullerton. And um, it was just a moment that got me so excited because she was hitting all different kinds of aspects of movement. She comes at it from um, a much more academic place than I do. She speaks of it in terms of rhetoric. But um, it just kind of blew open, you know, my, um, my desire to learn more about this specific relay race and the women that were involved, the women that organized it, and specifically why they chose a, a race, a relay race specifically, um, to bring attention to what they were trying to do at the conference and with the ERA. The relay race itself, yeah, there's, there's so many um, kind of metaphors that come with running in general. Um, running a race, uh, running individually, and then the relay race as well. And so all of those metaphors, that's what I think got me really excited in terms of um, the, the literal and figurative aspects of running a race cross country, specifically as it relates to women's rights. So um, Title IX you know, had recently been passed, I believe it was in 1972, um, and again, this conference was in 77. And so women were just starting to have um, permission basically to run um, amongst other you know athletic events and things up until that point it was believed that women were not physiologically able to um, have any sort of rigorous activity without passing out or you know dying so um, the the metaphors are really what get me um, excited and and just kind of get my brain going and then that relates back to you know ideas within the visual arts as well how strong um, metaphors can really get across messages so in terms of the the relay race you know there were some like visual cues kind of that um, that the organizers used in order to get across their message of equality. Um, and you know that had to do with um, the 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 three women that um, finished bringing the torch in were um, it was a white woman, a black woman, and a Latina woman. Um, and so that you know, as kind of simple as that can can look um, can seem, I think from you know more of what I'm learning at the time was really powerful in terms of the ideas of um, working together, equality. Um, you know, all of um, the sort of intersectional issues, you know, that, that come with the women's rights movement um, that are still, um, you know, needing to be addressed today. I think it was a way to show kind of a unified front, at least in part. Um, but then the fact that there were over 2,000 participants um, running this race across 14 states, um, you know, has a pretty powerful impact. And there was a stretch through Alabama where, you um, the race was boycotted. And so, you know, again, just in terms of metaphors and what it means for a woman to be running through that part of the country, um, you know, with ideas of, of civil rights, human rights, and specifically women's rights, and what it means to, you know, literally take off running and be carrying this torch that is a, a visual signifier of um, what, you know, a marathon or what running in this, in this kind of feat can mean. Um, I think becomes really powerful. And then reading Dr. Samick's essay, you know, um, just started to, to resonate with me more, again, the ideas of movement and who can move where, who's free to move in what space. Um, you know, it brings up ideas of immigration, migration, um, definitely racial issues, racial equity. Um, around the same time that I was watching Mrs. America, um, Ahmed Aubrey had been shot by two white men. Ahmed was a black man running through um, a nearby neighborhood to where he lived and he was shot and killed by um, two, potentially three uh, white men. Um, so, you know, the ideas of safety um, come into play when you're running out in space. 
um, in spaces that, you know, whether they're populated or isolated, um, there's always issues of safety. Um, but myself as a white woman, you know, I definitely um, am probably, definitely probably, I'm probably safer than a black woman running. Um, I'm definitely safer than a black man running at this time. But um, there's also been, you know, uh, horrific stories of white women being abducted while running. So it just brings up a lot of issues, again, of who is allowed in what space and to what capacity. Um, and the relay race, again, with the idea of metaphors, you know, it just parallels um, the language that we use in terms of running for office as well and political uh, within the political sphere. So, you know, the political races, again, running for office, um, ideas of, yeah, endurance and um, physical challenge. It's also a huge mental challenge to run long distances. It's a mental challenge to run short distances. So um, I just love those kind of overlaps of, of metaphor and movement. My interest in running has, um, you know, been lifelong, basically, and my um, training in the arts has been not quite as long, but also, you know, definitely a significant part of my life. And so the mentors that I've had through my career have mostly been women, and I'm thinking of um, a woman named Nancy Wozni, she has also been my editor. Um, she lives in Houston. That's where I met her. I lived in Houston, lived and worked there for several years. And so Nancy is trained in dance. And so we've been able to have amazing conversations about, um, again, movement, um, you know, what it means for different bodies to be in different spaces. And so Nancy as a dancer, as a trained dancer and arts writer, and then myself as a trained visual artist and curator and with my interest in running, we've been able to share a lot of different stories with each other about um, amazing uh, female choreographers, um, dance companies, you know, that are challenging not only the idea of, um, permission to be in a space, but what uh, what qualifies as dance. And, you know, again, ideas of movement. And within dance, there's so many layers to, um, to that movement, whether it's narrative or abstract. Um, and again, what the sort of message is that they're trying to communicate. And the more that I'm learning about um, running in different cultures, I won't say that running takes on the sort of function or, um, you know, presence of dance, but there's definitely more to running in different cultures than, you know, many of us might assume. So, um, you know, as I'm learning in, in different native tribes, there are um, ideas of prayer and um, bringing rain, um, you know, a lot of ideas as to what running and again just this movement over the land between sky and earth what that means and what that can do as i said i've worked mostly for and with women um, and you know there's been some women in my life that have made such a huge impact that maybe i haven't really noticed until you know taking time like this to reflect on their impact on my life so um, back to Houston, one woman that I worked for there named Karen Farber, um, she was the director of the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for the Arts, and she hired me straight out of graduate school. Um, I basically had no experience, and then Karen uh, got pregnant a few months into um, my job there, and so she you know, had to trust me pretty quickly with handling the kinds of projects that we were doing. Um, and they were large scale projects at that point. And so Karen was and is, um, you know, just a, a very kind, strong female that had a huge impact on me in terms of how I want to um, continue working in the arts, but also have, you know, leadership capacity within different arts organizations. Um, when I worked at the Mitchell Center, we commissioned works from artists and we worked with visual performing and literary artists. And um, by commissioning works, again, it was sort of transferring that trust in the creative process over to the artist and being a um, support structure for them in terms of, again, helping them get, a, get their message across through whatever you know, medium or genre they were working with. 
And um, even now working at Tamarin Institute, we are um, a staff made up primarily of women. Um, again, not to discount our male um, education director, Brandon, but, um, and now our curator, Ben, but you know, we, uh, women outnumber the men at Tamarin and Tamarin has a history of working um, with a lot of women. Um, we recently did a symposium called Head of a Woman where we looked at Tamarin's history as well as other print shops. And um, you know, we have been working primarily with female artists and we have had uh, female leadership for many years. And so the director there now is Diana Gaston. And she, again, very kind, generous, um, you know, visionary leader within an arts organization that I'm happy to be working under.